and welcome back and today I'm talking to you about how you can be a more environmentally conscious gardener. And being a gardener and growing your own food is already a very very eco-friendly thing to do but I'm going to speak to you about how you can be even more eco-friendly and try and help solve the climate crisis using gardening. And make sure you watch until the end where I'll be showing you why being a more eco-friendly gardener is a good thing to do and why these changes that I'm going to speak about actually do make a difference. The first thing I'm going to talk to you about which is going to make you a more eco-friendly gardener is to be reducing your plastic use in your garden. So ways you can do this is by doing things like maybe using reusable pots like cardboard and newspaper and another way is by re reusing the plastic you've already got rather than just chucking it away straight away. Keep reusing that and when it breaks recycle of it properly or use it for other things, maybe use it for drainage in other pots. And another thing you should do is start making your own cardboard pots and paper pots like I do. And there's also a video on my YouTube channel that shows you how to do this yourself. And something that all the gardeners can do is go peat free. And there's a lot of alternatives out there. And this compost that I've got here, which is peat free, has been assured and everything by the RHS, so it's a really good one. And it's, I think it's the best compost I've ever used. And I actually prefer it to the peat compost that I've previously used. And I think this is a change that any gardener should do. And unfortunately I filled one of my raised beds with some compost that had quite high peat in it. But it's there now so I can't really do anything about it. But I'm never using peat compost again. I'm going to keep using organic peat free compost. And something that you can do is reuse and recycle materials. And for example, this greenhouse here that I've got, it's all, mostly all, reclaimed materials. The only things I bought is some solar tunnel fabric that I used on each end because I ran out of glass and I also bought these hinges and some better screws and all of this cost me about £20 I think so this greenhouse cost me £20 and the rest of it was just asking around in my village asking for people who had pallet wood, old fence posts, things like this and I've used them and for example here is some old trellis posts we took the rotten bits off and it's doing really well and hopefully I'm going to paint and treat it this year and I think I might paint it like a beach hut maybe like a, a pale blue with some white stripes on it and there's also bits of our old coffee table on here so this is a really really good thing to do because it saves things from going to landfill and it also saves you money as well so there's no reason why you shouldn't start being more eco-friendly Something else reclaimed that I've got is I had a pallet from a neighbour that uh, they had some paving slabs come in and it's quite a high sided pallet and I had a builder's bag as well that I got topsoil delivered in when I got a new raised bed and what I did with this then is I put the builder's bag inside that pallet and I filled it with some compost and then I'm growing in it so that's a really good way to start reusing things and you don't even have to have a pallet to have a builder's bag in it you could just have a builder's bag, roll the tops down a little bit to give it some rigidity and maybe put a pallet around the top and you can just fill it and start using it just about straight away. I'd just like to make sure that you've gone down below, hit the subscribe button as well as the little bell icon and hit all on the notifications to make sure you're notified every time I upload a video. So another very good thing that you can do is to save water and that's because fresh water in the world is a very scarce and valuable thing in a lot of countries. So us who take it for granted, we should make the most of it and use it for the best things that we can. So for example, I've got a water butt here and what we put in this is whenever our hot water tap is heating up in the house, we'll put it into a bucket and then until the water's hot, so for example if we're having a shower, when the water's heating up and it's still cold and the boiler's still heating up, we save that water in a bucket and then we bring it out into this water butt and there's another one that we do that with. And then we store it and we use this when it's dry weather. But then I've also got two water butts that connect it up to a gutter. So this is something that anyone can do who has gutters on their house. You could even put gutters on your greenhouse or shed or whatever and you can catch water and it's, you'll be surprised how much water we catch. And even in some of the driest parts of the world, there's about 24,000 litres of rainfall every year I think it was. So that's quite crazy and you can put that straight into a water butt and you can have loads and loads of water. You can also get bigger things such as just IBC or intermediate bulk containers which you can get in about 600 litres or 1000 litres I think which is another great way of mass storing water 
so that you don't have loads of little tanks like this, you could have one or two big tanks like that. I was looking at them, but one, they're quite expensive, and I couldn't fit it through my gate to get it into my garden, I don't think. So it's just easier to get the smaller tanks. And the other thing with smaller tanks is that you can spread them around your garden. So I haven't got them all in one spot. I've got two over by that end of my garden, one over there, and one up here. So that whenever I'm watering, I don't have to keep walking back and forth to the same position. I could just top up wherever I run out. And if you want, you can even hook up a solar pump to the water tanks and you can run a hose from them. This will probably drain them quite quickly, but if you're, you don't want to have to use things like watering cans, then you can buy a solar pump for quite cheap on some online shops and you can just use this then rather than having to use watering cans. The next thing to make your garden more eco-friendly is to use less chemical feeds. And chemical feeds can use a lot of energy when they're being produced. And that's why I produce nettle feed. This nettle feed really smells. It's about a week and a half old now. As you'll see, you will have seen in my cucumber video that came up last. And this is a really, it's quite high in nitrogen, but it's also quite high in potash and phosphorus and potassium and all that. And I'm no chemistry nerd. I don't really know any of my chemicals. I wasn't very good at chemistry, but yeah, so nitrogen is quite high in nettles, but you can still use it for things like tomatoes. And I use this for my courgettes and cucumbers. And I'm just going to show you now how I do this. So I get a small watering can and I take some out the top, try and avoid getting bits in it. And then I put it in my watering can and then I dilute it about one part snackle feed to 10 parts water. And then what this will do is it will not be too strong and it won't burn the roots or the leaves on the plant and it'll keep the plant growing well. So this is my watering can that I use to measure it. I just stick it in. Some people strain it off, but I try and not get too many bits in it by trying to let it all settle to the bottom before I do it and just take it off the top. You get some bits of nettle leaf in it, but what I do is I don't use the rows. So I don't use the rows on the watering can when I do this so that I can avoid blocking it up. So I've got some in there. It's very frothy, this stuff. So this here is just gonna be, oh, hold on. That's already quite full, so I'll just fill it up the rest with some of this nettle feed. And I can't tell you how much this smells. And unfortunately, smell of vision hasn't been, it hasn't been invented yet. And when it is, I feel sorry for you all because this absolutely stinks. So I'm gonna leave this with the nettle stuff. I'll take the rose off, as I said and then I'm gonna go and feed my cucumbers because they're starting to go into fruit and so are my courgettes. And another really good feed that you can use that's really natural is wormery feed and or some people call it worm tea, worm juice, whatever you want to call it or whatever you do call it. It's a really, really good feed. I think it's really high in nitrogen. I'm not sure on that one. You'll have to Google it or ask me in the comments and I'll research it for you. But it's meant to be really high in nitrogen and you could use this on lots of different things, like kale, perennial kale especially, because perennial kale grows in the same spot for ages and this could take a lot out of the soil. You could basically feed anything that has a lot of foliage on, so also ornamentals as well, like heucheras or grasses that you could feed with it. And nettle feed, mine's filling up really quick at the moment because I got new worms and they're working quite fast and I think they're quite young compared to my old ones. And it did fill up a lot the other day as well. I think it's because it rained as well. But I've been collecting that and I've got it in an old bottle that I've recycled and that's another thing as well. And I've recycled that and now I'll have be able to use that on my plants when I want to. So that's another thing, store it. But don't store it too long because it stinks as I said and it can smell even more. And if you are gonna store something like nettle feed or your worm feed, because it's high in nitrogen, you, if I was you, I would keep it out of direct sunlight, so in a dark, dark place, because otherwise you'll get an algal bloom, which is basically where loads of algae grows. And it happens when manure gets into rivers and things, and the algae starts to fill the river or the pond or lake or whatever. 
So that's why I should keep it out of the light because it prevents things like algae growing in it and completely using up all your fertilizer. Something else you should try and do is increase your wildlife and biodiversity. So here I've got one of my wildflower patches where I don't mow the lawn in the summer. And as you can see, I've got lots of flowers. I've got some speedwell, clover, and I've also got some buttercups. And I've, also, I've just got loads of different plants coming through, which will hopefully be really good for encouraging pollinators like bees and butterflies, which as we all know, need a lot of help at the moment. And this also will give cover for other things. So these could be things like ladybirds and things like that, especially growing more nettles will do that. And ladybirds and things like wasps and things like that, and hoverflies as well, are a really, really good way of trying to get rid of things like aphids and greenfly, which I've got a bit of on my raspberries at the moment. But there's not too much, and that's probably because I've got these natural areas where I've got the predators coming in as well. And this is a great way of trying to stop using your chemical pesticides, because you get the predator, the natural predator in, so you don't have to come in and get rid of them yourself. So as I just said, growing more shrubs and trees can help and this is because they have woodier stems and that's a bigger store of carbon and in the carbon cycle there's a lot of stores and flows and these stores are things like trees and peat bogs which is another reason why you should go peat free but when you start taking these things down they then become an output so they put the carbon out into the atmosphere and what we want is to start storing it in long-term stores that we're not going to be cutting down that can store it there for a long time or forever such as peat bogs or these trees and sorry I just got spiked by it then but yeah so trees and things like this so over there as well I've got a, a willow or two willows that I've got in my pot in pots and I'm also going to use these to try and make my own hormone uh, rooting thing to try and root cuttings which Tapo North Farm, another great YouTube channel, commented on one of my videos and gave me that tip, which is where you put it with boiling water for 24 hours, and this will give a water or a liquid that's got high hormones in it that you can dip your cuttings in, or just keep your root cuttings in there, and they'll root really quickly and strongly. Something you should do is go no dig, and this is what I've been for this year, but this flower bed I don't think has been dug for maybe two or three years, and that's because I made it three years ago and I haven't hardly dug it since then. I use a hoe on it, but that's something you can do because you can it's just scratching the subsurface. But deep digging of the soil is bad because, once again, soil is another carbon store. And what this will do by digging it is releases all this carbon. And you don't want that. You want And you want all the fungi and the microbacteria and things like this to all work in harmony to have a really healthy soil. And this soil here is very, very rich, as most of my soil at the moment, because I've started to really look after my soils. And that's something that I think people need to value more than feeding plants, is feeding the soil. Because if you look after the soil, it'll look after your plants, and in turn, the plants will look after you. So that's, that's the system I follow. And it's also the system I follow with pests. So if you have something like green fly, if you keep them there, it'll attract the ladybugs, which will then eat it and eat other aphids whilst they're here. And also wasps and hoverflies do the same. So it's all about a system and it's all about chains and webs. And if you take one thing out of them, it can affect it all dramatically. Another great thing that I do to try and protect my soil is mulches. And this is a, an old grass clipping mulch that I've got here. And it's started to break down and make the soil quite good. It's quite compact here because Alfie the dog walks over it quite a bit to have a shortcut over here and so do I so I can't blame him and it doesn't matter that it's compact because soil from dogs and humans standing on it won't get too compact it'll be firm and that's why you can go in there with a hoe and just scrape the surface of the soil if you're going to sow anything but I've got this butternut squash here which will just ramble over here and I've also got these sunflowers that are, seem to be starting to produce flowers I think and rot what mulches are good at is protecting the soil from the sun and it stops evaporation and sort of the soil degradation by the wind and weathering and the reason we need to protect our soil from things like the sun is because we don't want desertification which is happening quite largely in things like the Sahara at the moment where it's spreading where the desert never used to be and 
this is natural sometimes but this has been sort of sped up by humans which is why we need to protect it and that's why trees are good as well in the garden because they produce a dappled shade which protects the ground from the, the harsh sunlight something cool in the Sahara which you can go and look up after this which is really interesting I find is something called the Green Belt Project which is where they're planting a big belt of green trees across the bottom of the Saharan Desert something that a lot of people are starting to do is have green roofs on things like sheds and greenhouses that have roofs like felt roofs like I've got and this is something that really interests me and hopefully one day I'll have a shed that'll have a strong enough frame to be able to hold the green roof because it can be heavy but what this is, normally it's like gravel and you have things like succulents and alpines on top that don't need too much attention and what this does is it creates a roof that rather than being burst for the environment with things like felt and tar or whatever what this does then is it will again change carbon dioxide into oxygen it won't do it as big as things like trees will but it'll also, every little thing helps that's the, real, the other thing I want to say is every little thing here doesn't sound like much but if everyone did it it'll work quite well and that's the thing it might not work if one person does it but when the masses do it that's when the change will happen so green roofs is something that I want to try out and I might try it with my greenhouse someday unless I get a glass roof it just looks quite cool as well and you can have flowers on top and it just makes your roof look really pretty and you can also make your house more pretty for anyone who flies over in an aeroplane that last bit was a bit of a joke because people from aeroplanes probably won't notice one exact house having a green roof but I'm not sure and now I'm going to talk to you about why it helps so I've already spoken to you about why peat bogs are, need to be protected and things like that and one other reason they need to be protected is because they're ancient they've been there for hundreds and, or if not thousands of years and we're going there and taking it away and putting it in compost bags and the reason we need to make natural feeds like wormery and nettle feed is because Making chemicals and man-made feeds uses a lot of electricity and energy because you have to break, often have to break down the chemicals into other chemical formulas and different things like that which can use a lot of electricity and depending on where they are electricity can be produced by things like coal but in the UK we've been going over two months now without burning any coal for electricity which is a really good move in the right direction but in other places they might be less eco-friendly with their energy and that's why we need to try and make our own natural feeds which also helps the problem with weeds such as nettles you can either feed them to your worms or make them into feed and another way you can do it is chop and drop which someone taught me in the comments before which is where you chop the nettle or the comfrey or whatever you're making it out of and you just put it as a mulch around the base of plants and what this does is the, it'll rot down and the plants will absorb it and the reason we need to save water is for, because when you're putting fresh water from the tap especially, maybe not rainwater so much, but fresh water from the tap straight down the drain, once for example the boiler's heating up, what this does then is it's putting water that could be drank or could be used for food growing straight down the drain and you're wasting money and there's a lot of people in the world who can't have water unfortunately at the moment. For example, I've been using the water into the water butts that we would be normally losing when the water's heating up and I've been putting this to grow food for our family and putting it into the ground which will in turn grow things like trees and food and so I hope this video made you think a bit differently about the environment and how what you can do in your little patch in your garden there's also a whole host of things you can do in your home as well so make sure you start looking into it so you can be a more eco-friendly person please make sure you like, comment and share this with your friends to make sure that everyone knows how to be a more eco-friendly gardener. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you next time.